Πάτερ ημών, ο εν της ουρανής, αγιαστή το το όνομά σου, ελθέ το η βασιλεία σου, γεννηθεί το το θελημά σου, ως εν ουρανό και επί της ημών των επιούσιων, This Sunday we begin a new sermon series. We've concluded the Good Advice series, which was a lot of fun, um, but this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, Lost in Translation is something that I've been wanting to do for some time. Um, it's based loosely off of a book, uh, but that book was based less loosely off of the lectures of the author that I was able to be a part of um, in my, my seminary training on just the shortfalls of the English translation that we read as the Bible. Um, so much of our conflict in the, uh, in the Bible comes down to words. What does this word mean? The, the, the text says this, and so it must mean that. And we start to really get lost in nuance uh, because we forget something, and that something is the Bible was not written in English. In fact, most of the things we're going to talk about this, this week, um, this week and going forward, is the, the Hebrew language, which is a beautiful language. Uh, the way that they wrote was beautiful. Everything had a poetic element to it. And a lot of the nuance is lost when we try to force it into English. And Greek does that as well. And, and so there may be some New Testament coverage near the end of this series. Uh, but each week what I want to do is provide you with a possible resource. If this is something that's interesting to you and you want to learn how to read the Bible and study the Bible differently than you are right now, or if, you, if you're looking to start studying the Bible, um, then this is a great starting place. The resource that I want to point out is called The Strange and Sacred Scripture. It's here, but it's also up there. Um, it is, it's written in a, what's called ad populum, which is um, in, in a way that's easily accessible. You could, you could read this without a, a seminary degree, um, and it will explain a lot of great things about the Old Testament. A lot of the strange things um, that we struggle with, the things that don't make sense, or the things that seem mystical or magical, or even just otherworldly that we don't see in our lives today, and what that might mean in the Bible. Um, and it talks a little bit about the things that we are going to be covering this series. So check it out. It's available on Amazon. It's also expensive because it's written by a seminary professor, and they only sell like a hundred of these books in their lifetime because not many people want, you know, this isn't something that we buy and give people. So it's a little expensive. So if you're really, if you're really, really excited about reading this um, and, and you want to borrow mine, that's okay too. So when we when we look at texts, when we look at the Bible, we see the English, um, and depending on our translation, we see the English that, that might be different than the English of somebody else's Bible, uh, but we we understand most of what's going on. Uh, today we're going to be looking at a verse right at the beginning of the Bible, a passage that you may have heard before, you very likely have heard before, but you may have even read in the Bible yourself in English. Um, some of you may have read this when you were so young that many of the translations that I used didn't even exist at the time because every, every month a new translation of the Bible comes out and it's very confusing on to which to read. 
Um, so today, I'm going to put one up on the screen if you want to follow along. It is uh, Genesis 3, 7, I believe, uh, through 4 something. Um, you'll see. So if you want to follow along, it's, it's right up here. But you can also follow in your pew Bibles, but that will be a different version than this. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. Uh, the name of the first was Pishon. In winds to the entire land of Hivala, where there is gold, the gold of the land is good. Uh, aromatic resin and onyx are there also. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it's, it winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It runs across the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had, had uh, formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a woman leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said that the, to the serpent, We will eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God says, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, for you, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the fruit um, of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is actually two stories put back to back because um, I want to talk about both of them in different ways, but also as them together. Uh, the first is the, the creation of Adam and Eve, or, or man and woman. And then, the, then the latter part of the story, specifically Adam and Eve's um, sort of hijinks in the, in the Garden of Eden. And you might have noticed the first time that Adam's name popped up was in the middle of that second story. Before then, it was just a man, or the man. When we, when we look at Hebrew, and we translate it to English, Hebrew words have, have two parts. Their sound, which is what the word sounds like, and their meaning. Both are equally important. Um, but many times when we translate, we lose one of those things. 
we lose the, 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 the meaning behind the word or we learn or we lose the sound of the Hebrew word, right? There's not a lot of words of Hebrew that we speak out of the Bible other than places and names. The first I want to talk about is this idea of, of losing the meaning by keeping the sound. And we see this most evidently in biblical names. Names all mean something in the Bible. In fact, they often mean a lot to the story. But we don't know that because other than your own name, you probably don't know what other names mean. That's not something that's common for us. Uh, to give you an example of what this might look like outside of the Bible, who's this guy? Darth Vader. So, again, this movie came out long enough ago that if you haven't seen it and I spoil something for you, that's on you. So Darth Vader. There was, there was some... Uh, build up here to a big reveal about Darth Vader, right? Remember, it was, it was in uh, The Empire Strikes Back and this climactic scene where we find out Darth Vader's who? Luke's father. Do you guys know what the word Vader means in German? Father. So there was an entire group of people that speaks German that was like, well, yeah, I thought that's why his name was Vader. You guys didn't know that? Come on. They knew like that. There was a meaning behind the sound of that name that us were just like, what? Father, mind blown. So when we look at this, we have these names, right? Adam, Eve, and Eden. There are three names out of this story. Adam means humanity. Um, some people would translate it as man. Um, because that's the patriarchy. Um, it means humankind, not just men, but, but humankind. Eve means life. Eden means delight. These are the words that when, when the Hebrew people would have read this text or been told this, when they heard Adam is how it's pronounced, they would have known that to mean human being. That, that there's not something as um, limiting is just the name. So you could summarize this part of the story. Adam and Eve originally lived in the Garden of Eden. And we, we have filled this with proper nouns that only mean one thing, and it's the sound. Of, this, is a, this is a person who's called Adam and a person who's called Eve that live in a place that is nicely called Eden. But it really means humanity and life originally lived in the Garden of Delight. Do you see how much more you get from this sentence? What do we know about the Garden of Eden just by saying Garden of Eden? It's just a place. Or the Garden of Delight. We were put into a whole different mindset. Humanity and life originally lived in the Garden of Delight. What we have to be careful of is when we, when we don't look deeper into the meaning of the, the words the sounds, and these tend to be more proper nouns, um, we lose something that the author wanted us to know. And that's really the key of this entire lesson for today, is the idea that the author is trying to communicate something to you about God. And that's true through the entire Bible, and all the different genres, and all the different books, someone is trying to communicate a truth about God to you. And what we've done is mucked it up by taking it out of the original language. Uh, and made it harder. Now the other side of this coin is that we can keep the meaning and lose the sound, which might sound like it's not as important, right? Because if I were to just speak Hebrew, you wouldn't know what I was saying, so how important could the sound be? But what we need to explore is the idea that Hebrew, the people who write in Hebrew, the language of Hebrew, is so much more thought out and beautiful in the writing styles than we do for most of what we write in English. Um, what is very common in Hebrew is called wordplay. Things like alliteration, which is when you have two things with the same beginning sound, right? Or uh, rhyming. Or words that just compound on each other and how important that is to, to notice. Um, there's, there's a passage in Jonah that talks about the big fish. 
And big fish is fine, right? That's, you understand what that is. It's a fish, but really big, right? But the Hebrew for big fish is dogodo. It was written that way and probably described that way because of the beauty of, of those phonetics together, dogodo. I'm not, we're not saying that we should just start saying the go Godot and expect people to know what that is, but you need to know the depth. So when we look at this, um, well, first, let me, let me back up. Um, we're going to explore the word Adam, and this will be confusing because I just said with Adam, we kept the sound but lost the meaning, right? And now we're going to talk about how Adam has lost the sound but kept the meaning. And if you're taking notes in the back, you're like, Kellen, that's not right. The word Adam, used to mean humanity, appears in the Old Testament over 500 times. There are 500 plus sentences that refer to Adam. Not capital A, Adam. Just humanity, or a man, or a human, or even a woman sometimes is the Adam. So when we look at this, we have to understand that Adam both means the human that God created in that instance, but also it can mean any human or all of humanity. And this is where you're starting to see how confusing this can be and like how, what a job it would be to sit down and be like, well, these all say Adam. And we can't just all call them the same thing, right? Because different contexts mean different things. So we have this this earlier, right at the beginning, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. In Hebrew, this would read the same as, as when we called Adam, Adam. It would have said, you could have translated this, then the Lord God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. But they didn't. That's not how they translated it. So what we look at, again, Adam means humanity, dust of the ground, or earth, or dirt, or sod, or mud. All of these words could have come from Adama. So here's one of our word plays, uh, Adam and Adama. When we say that, I'm going to go back, when we talk about man and dust of the ground, even when we say man and dust, man and mud, man and, man and earth, there's no link there, right? Those are two very different words that mean very different things. All of a sudden, when we look at the Hebrew, Adam and Adama, there's a connection. There's an intimacy there. Human and, and um, later, later we translate Adama to, to say fertile land. So when we look at this, Adam and Adama, we should see ourselves in the description of the planet that we live on, the ground that we walk in. The, the very dirt that was formed to create us from this story. So to, to tweak this, what we just looked at, then God gathered up the earth and formed an earthling from it. This is the closest we have to have that connection, earth and earthling. And like nobody says earthling other than like really bad old sci-fi movies, right? So like this is not how it's translated. No Bible in the world says God created the earth and created an earthling because it sounds ridiculous. But this is so much closer to what we should be drawing from this one verse, is the connection that we have with the earth, what we have with fertile ground. We should feel intimately linked to the, to the land that we live on. I think this would have a, 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 if we understood this as a religion, we would have a very different view on how we treat the planet, how we treat the the sustainability of our presence here, how churches could be leading the charge to preserve this beautiful planet that we've been entrusted. And that's one of the messages of this story, is that we are to cultivate and protect and work the ground we've been given. We should also see the Adam in the Adama. We should identify with the possibilities and the potential of fertile ground that as, as potential filled as the earth is to grow and to change and to bear life and sustain life, so are you. So are we. That's something that we should feel together when we read this simply by knowing that our name for our existence is the same as the earth, Adam and Adama. 
Do you see what we have lost? We were created to be one with the earth. So when we when we start, and this is, so this is to summarize what I was just saying. We were created to be one with the earth, and we will look back on the first part of this about the, the name the name. Humanity and life were driven out of perpetual delight due to our own desire of power. That's the story of Adam and Eve. I took a summary and I changed Adam and Eve to have their names in Eden. So humanity and life, Adam and Eve, were driven out of perpetual delight or the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delight, due to our own desire of power. And that's the rest of the story. We wanted Eve wanted knowledge. We wanted knowledge. I'm not pointing fingers. Everybody wants knowledge and power and riches and fame. And, and like literally the first opportunity, the first temptation in the world, we failed. Like, oh, for one. And it all was downhill from there. What I want you to think about when we look at the Bible and when you study the Bible is know that the, the letter and the ink on the page is not magical, it's not mystical. We like to talk about the Bible as the holy word of God, which is is. But we should know that God doesn't speak English. Jesus didn't speak English. That's gonna, you know, King James is not God. You know, when you say King James Bible, he's just a guy, right? And it's actually one of the, the, the lesser accurate translations of the Bible out there, because it was the first. And we've approved, improved upon it. So what we need to do is be, be willing to look deeper and willing to be challenged to say that English is not the best language in the world. That's the Americans in us, you know. English, English, no. Have you ever been to another country? They speak English plus nine other languages. We're terrible about that. We're like, hey, they'll learn English because it's better than their language. I'm telling you right now, Hebrew is better than English. I don't know how to speak Hebrew, so that's, that's the stubbornness in me. When we leave the Hebrew behind, we leave something, and it can create conflict. If you are familiar with any of the conflict between creation and evolution, the idea that uh, the Bible is not reconcilable with science and all of these things, this is one of the stories that boggles people's minds in this conversation. But when you look at it in the Hebrew, it's no longer about science. This is not a map or a, a, a fossil records, and this is not to dispute what you see in the museums when you see those giant skeletons. What this is about is humanity and life were driven out of perpetual delight due to our own desire for power, and we were created to be connected to the earth in the most intimate of ways. That is what the story is about. So all of a sudden, when we read this in the Hebrew text and understand it, we, inv we are invited to see these characters as us, as mirror images of who we are and to represent humanity uh, as a whole. Reading the text this way does not diminish the truth behind it. In fact, it calls us to, to see a deeper meaning in the story in such a way that it's true for your life. This story is about the creation, but it's about creation in a way that means something to how you act today and how you move forward through your life. To say that we have been messing up since the beginning. Whether that beginning was the way that it is in here or a different representation, we are a flawed people. And God gave us really important jobs to do one of which is to take care of this planet that we have, to be the vessel of life and, and uh, 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 sustaining life and um, fertility, all of these things that are coming through us out into the world. That is in our very creation. When we see this, this story is about you and about me and about now and about the future. These are important things to realize. The hard thing about a sermon series like this is my wrap-up every week is going to be like, so read the Bible better. Um, and that's not a great wrap-up. One of the things I would challenge you to do is start thinking of ways of expanding your knowledge. 
Um, there are Bible studies out there. I will continue to be giving resources. Uh, the book that I, uh, The Strange and Sacred Scripture, um, is a really great book. I've read it seven times now. I read it twice in preparation for today. It takes about a day. It's really an easy read. Um, but get it. Thumb through it. Circle and highlight things that don't make sense or change the things that do make sense. Or if you have a Bible, when they have the little numbers or letters at the end of a verse and you're like, that's annoying, and you just keep going, those tell you something at the bottom. And it's sometimes it's something really cool, like Vader means father in German, and it will change everything for you. It's our responsibility to decipher the Bible if we are going to tell other people what it means. If we're going to be the experts of Christianity, if we're going to go out into the world and say we have a truth that other people don't, we have to know what that truth actually is. And the only way to do that is through Bible study, it's through understanding a little bit of Hebrew, not a lot, or at least to be willing to, to talk to people who know better than you and to listen. So as we go from this place, I encourage you to remember that words have meaning, and they have sound. And English often forgets the Hebrew one, two, or sometimes both. So be an active reader of your Bible. That's how we know the word of God. Let us pray.